Hello and welcome to the course on theory of computation. In our last class, we talked about basic building blocks of a formal language. In this class, let us talk about grammars, machines and languages. So a machine can be thought of a device which can accept a language. For example, let us say here is a machine in which we can send inputs which are strings using English alphabets. So for example, we can send an input BOY or BYO. These are all strings formed from English alphabet. And there is a light which glows only when the input string belongs to the English dictionary. So for example, if you send a correct word, which is BOY, which is present in the English dictionary, then the light will glow. But if I send a word which is not present in the English dictionary, like BYO, then the light does not glow. So we can send all kinds of strings using English alphabet to this machine and we can check if the light glows or not. Whenever the light glows, we understand that this string that we have sent is part of the English dictionary. In other words, this machine accepts all words in the English language. So such a hypothetical machine can behave like an accepting device which accepts a language. Now, in this course, we will be studying automata. Basically, theory of computation is the study of such abstract machines, which are called automata, which can solve computational problems. We use a formal language to communicate with the abstract machines. Alternately, an automata or a machine can be viewed as a device which accepts all the words in a formal language. Like we have just seen, we can think of an abstract conceptual machine which accepts all the words in the English dictionary. So we will think of machines which accepts all the words in a formal language in this course. Now let us look at an example of an automaton. Automaton is the singular number, by the way, and automata is plural. Okay, let's say our alphabet contains only two symbols, 0 and 1. And we have a language in which there are only two words, 0, 1 and 1, 0. Now, let us design an automaton over this alphabet to accept the strings in the given language. Okay. So, let's try to build a machine, conceptual machine by the way, which will accept all the words in the language L. So, basically it accepts two words, 0, 1 and 1, 0. The machine starts from an initial state. So before we provide any input to the machine, it is in a state which is called the initial state. Now how do you know this is the initial state? The initial state is known by an incoming arrow without a, name, uh, without a label on the arrow. So if you see a state, a state is represented by a circle with an incoming arrow without anything written over the arrow, you should understand that this is an initial state. And we call this initial state Q0. Now from the initial state, if a zero input is given to the machine, it goes to the state Q1. Now it's kind of memory, it's to remember things. For example, if I ask you that currently the machine is from Q1, so can you tell me what input was given? You can immediately say, yes, the input was zero, right? So it is like the machine remembers that I have received a zero. So it has to start from the initial state and after it is given an input zero, from initial state it goes to state q1 at state q0 which is the initial state once again if an input 1 is given then the machine goes to state q2 now from q1 if a one input is given the machine goes to q3 and from q2 if a zero input is given the machine goes to q3 now q3 is called the final state or accepting state how do i know this is the final state this is known because this state is constituted with two concentric circles so if you see a state with two concentric circles, you should understand that this is a final state. Just as a state with an incoming arrow without any level is understood to be a initial state. One thing I should tell you that a machine has only one initial state, but it can have more than one final state. As we go along in this course, we'll see more machines which have more than one final state. Now let us look at this machine and let us see what kind of words does this machine accept. So it has to start from initial state. So from initial state, if I get a 0, I go to Q1. And from Q1, if I get a 1, I go to Q3, which is an accepting or a final state. So it accepts a word which is 0, 1. Similarly, 
from q0 if we get a 1 we go to q2 and from q2 if we get a 0 we get to q3 so it accepts a word which is 1 0 so does it accept any other word other than 0 or 0 1 or 1 0 for example would it accept a word like 0 0 so if i get 0 from the initial state i'll go to state q1 if i get another 0 the machine does not go anywhere right so in that case it won't accept it has to accept all the words whenever it reaches the final state or the accepting state so it can reach the final state from the initial state with only two words 0 1 and 1 0 that's why it accepts the words in this language and it accepts no other word hence this can be thought of a conceptual or an abstract machine which accepts the word in this language so for, from now onwards whenever we think of a machine which will think of an abstract device which accepts the words in a formal language okay now let us talk about grammar we recall that a formal language consists of a set of words or strings whose letters or symbols are taken from an alphabet and are well formed according to a specific set of rules the set of production rules for the strings in a language is given by a grammar these rules describe how to form strings from the language's alphabets or how to form words from the language's alphabet that are valid according to the language's syntax let us look at an example so again let us say our alphabet contains only two letters 0 and 1 and the language has only two words 0 1 and 1 0 so we will design a grammar that produces the strings in this language okay remember the machine was viewed as a device which can accept accept the strings in the language whereas a grammar is viewed as a procedure which can produce the strings in the language so let us say our grammar has three production rules the first production rule says s arrow a b or b a the second production rule says a arrow 0 and the third production rule says b arrow 1 now what does this mean this kind of uh, uh, notation where we have uh, something in the left hand side then an arrow and something in the right hand side is called a production rule so the first production rule says s arrow a b or b a now s is called a start symbol just as a machine has an initial state a grammar production rule has to have a start symbol and usually the start symbol is denoted by capital s so whenever you see a capital letter in a production rule you should understand that this is like a variable or a non-terminal so for example a and b these are capital letter symbols we should understand these are non-terminals okay now what is non-terminal mean non-terminal mean it can be replaced by some other thing and what is that some other thing that some other thing can be either another non-terminal or terminals like zeros and ones so whenever you see digits or you know lowercase symbols you should understand by convention these are terminals so a non-terminal can be replaced by another non-terminal or a terminal or a combination of a non-terminal or a term terminal in this case these non-terminals have been replaced by terminals so these are the production rules of our grammar the first production rule says if i have a start symbol remember the grammar has to start from a start symbol so if i get a start symbol i can replace it either by a b or b a now if i have a b a i can replace it by zero if i have a b i can replace it by one now looking at this drama let's see what kind of uh, words does it produce so starting from the start symbol if you take this production rules which says s can be replaced by a b so you can produce an a and a b from s and then look at this production rule it says a can be replaced by 0 so replace a by 0 and b can be replaced by 1 so replace b by 1 so what is the word that you can produce the word is 0 1 which is a part of the language if you look at the other production rule which says s can be replaced by ba so s can produce ba from b i can produce a 1 and from a i can produce a zero so what is the word in this case the word is one zero once again which is a part of this language now from this set of production rules we can generate all the words in the language and no other word 
So hence a grammar can be thought of a producing device, just as a machine can be thought of an accepting device, a grammar can be thought of a producing device which produces the strings in a language. So let me now discuss about the components of a grammar. A grammar can be depicted as a four tuple given by Vn, Sigma, P and S, where Vn is a finite non-empty set of elements which are called variables or non-terminals. In the previous example, we had three variables given by S, A and B. Usually, the non-terminals of the variables are depicted by uppercase symbols. Sigma is a set, a finite set, whose elements are called terminals. Now, notice one thing here. We said that Vn is a finite non-empty set. That means a grammar has to have non-terminals. Whereas sigma is a finite set, but we are not saying that it is a non-empty set. That means sigma can be empty. That means a grammar can have no terminals. For example, a language which is an empty set or a language which contains only the null string are theoretically valid. So even if the grammar has no terminals, then the language produced by the grammar can be either an empty set or a set which is containing only one string which is the empty string and they are theoretically valid. So sigma can be an empty set but it has to be finite whereas vn has to be both finite and non-empty. That means we have to have non-terminals for a grammar. Terminal set can be empty. Another Im important property is that if we take the intersection and vn and sigma we will get an empty set. That means vn and sigma are mutually disjoint. There are no elements which are common both to terminals and non-terminals. S is a special variable which belongs to Vn and we call it the start symbol. P is a finite non-empty set of production rules whose elements are of the form alpha, arrow, beta, where alpha and beta can be any combination of terminals and non-terminals with the restriction that alpha must contain at least one non-terminal. So for example, if sigma is the set of alphabets containing two symbols 0 and 1 and vn is the set of non-terminals containing symbols capital A and B, then a arrow 0 b, 1 b arrow a, b arrow 1, 1 a arrow epsilon are all valid productions. If you notice in all these cases, the left hand side of the production contains at least one non-terminal. For example, here it has only one symbol in the left hand side which is a, it is a non-terminal. In the second case, 1b has two symbols, one is a terminal, but b is a non-terminal and so on. So in all these cases, the left hand side of the production rule has a non-terminal. But if you take this uh, production into consideration, 1 arrow a0, the left hand side contains only one, which is not a non-terminal. It is a terminal. So it is not a valid production rule. In other words, the production rule can be of the form alpha arrow beta where alpha and beta can be any combination of terminals and non-terminals but the restriction is that alpha must contain at least one non-terminal. So to summarize our discussion, a formal language can be described by one, a machine that accepts the language or two, a grammar that generates the language. So in this course, we will study formal languages in terms of grammars and machines. In the next class, We'll talk about the Chomsky hierarchy of grammars. Thank you.